Now that we know what a general vector space is, we want to be prepared to consider smaller structures, which are subsets of a vector space, that are themselves also vector spaces. These vector spaces inside of vector spaces are called subspaces. Today we'll look at the definition of a vector subspace. We will introduce and prove the subspace test, which is used to determine if a non-empty subset is a subspace. And then we'll look at a few interesting examples and non-examples. There are chapters in the descriptions. So you can skip around the video as you please. Beginning with the definition. A subset W of a vector space V is called a subspace of V if W is a vector space itself under the same addition and scalar multiplication operations that are defined on the containing vector space V. So W has to be a subset of V and under the same operations as defined on V, W has to be a vector space itself. That's what it means to be a subspace. This of course means that W needs to fit all 10 of the vector space axioms. And here those axioms are. This is a bit of an intimidating list. Seems like a lot of work to show something is a subspace. But in fact, a lot of these properties are just inherited from the containing vector space V. For example, property two, the commutativity of a vector addition. If any two vectors commute in the vector space V, well, all of the vectors in a subset of V are still in V2, so obviously property 2 would hold. We don't really need to worry about verifying that. If W is a subset of V, any two vectors in W are also in V, and so of course they would also commute. Similarly, for property 3, if the addition of vectors in V is associative, well, the vectors in W are also in V, so vector addition there is associative too. Similar logic shows that a subset W will also inherit properties 7, 8, 9, and 10. And so the only four non-trivial axioms that we would need to verify to show something is a subspace is axiom 1, the closure of vector addition, Axiom 4, the existence of a zero vector. Axiom 5, the existence of vector negatives. And axiom 6, closure under scalar multiplication. These properties are not necessarily inherited from the vector space V. This is because if W is a subset of V, that of course doesn't mean that it has to contain the zero vector. Maybe it's a subset without the zero vector. Similarly, it doesn't have to contain negatives. Maybe it only contains vectors from V excluding their negatives. Closure under vector addition and scalar multiplication obviously don't have to hold either. This is a pictorial representation of a vector space V and a subset W, which may not be a subspace. How could this fail to be a subspace? Well, if we have two vectors in W, U, and V, if we add these vectors together, that would look something like this, which is clearly not in W. It is in V, but it's not in W. Just because W is a subset of V doesn't mean it's going to be closed under vector addition, which is why that's something we have to check. Similarly, we could scale the vector u by some scalar k such that k times u actually leaves w. And so w doesn't necessarily have to be closed under scalar multiplication either. These are things that need to be verified to ensure w is a subspace. But even this is not as bad as it seems. In fact, all we actually need to verify if w is a non-empty subset of a vector space v is that it fits actually axiom 1, it's closed under vector addition, and it fits axiom 6, it's closed under scalar multiplication. As long as it's non-empty and has these two properties, it's actually quite easy to show that it has the other two properties as well, and thus it satisfies all vector space axioms, and so by definition is a subspace. This fact that we only have to prove axioms 1 
and 6 in order to establish all the others is the subspace test. Let's go ahead and prove that test now before we apply it to a few examples. This is the subspace test I just described. If W is a non-empty set of vectors in a vector space V, then W is a subspace of V if and only if the following two conditions are satisfied. Condition one is closure under vector addition. Condition two is closure under scalar multiplication. Note this is an if and only if statement. If we know that W is a subspace, then by definition it fits all 10 vector space axioms, including these two. So that direction of the proof is trivial. If V is a subspace, Obviously, it fits these two conditions because it fits all 10 of the vector space axioms. So we'll just worry about proving the other direction. Assuming that W is a non-empty set of vectors in a bigger vector space, V, and it fits these two conditions, let's prove that it's a subspace. In order to do that, we just need to prove that it fits these other two axioms, axiom 4 and 5, the existence of a zero vector and the existence of negatives because again, all of the other axioms are trivially inherited from the vector space V. And here is our proof. We assume W is a subset of a vector space V, and we're assuming conditions one and two hold. Then we can take a vector U from W. We know that we can take a vector from W because W is assumed to be non-empty. We know then by condition two that any scalar K times the vector U must also be in our subset W. In particular, if we multiply the arbitrary vector U by the zero scalar, we get the zero vector. And so this has to be in W because we assume W was closed under scalar multiplication. So that forces it to contain the zero vector. Similarly, if we have this arbitrary vector u, we could multiply it by the scalar negative 1. That has to be in w as well because w is closed under scalar multiplication. But if we multiply a vector by the scalar negative 1, we get the negative of the vector. Thus, w must contain the zero vector and negatives. So this gives us an easy way to determine if a subset of a vector space V is a subspace of V. All we have to do is check that it's non-empty and then check that it is closed with respect to vector addition and scalar multiplication. If we can prove those things, then it's a subspace. Let's jump into some examples. These first two are sometimes called the trivial subspaces because every vector space has these two subspaces. First is the zero subspace, which is sometimes denoted with a big Z. If we consider any vector space V, it must contain a zero vector because that's one of the vector space axioms. So consider the subset of V, call it W, which contains only the zero vector. By the subspace test, this is clearly a subspace of V. It's non-empty because it contains the zero vector. It's closed with respect to vector addition because the zero vector plus the zero vector is the zero vector, which is in W. And it's closed with respect to scalar multiplication because any scalar times a zero vector produces a zero vector, which again is in W. So it's non-empty. It fits the two conditions we need. By the subspace test, the zero subspace is always a subspace. You can just take the zero vector from a vector space and you get this tiny little subspace. Even more trivially, we have the vector space itself. If V is a vector space and W equals V, well, technically then W is a subspace of V because every set is a subset of itself and Obviously, W would fit all 10 vector space axioms because W is just V, and V fits all the vector space axioms. Even the subspace test is not necessary here. Here are some more interesting examples. Any line through the origin in the vector space R2 or the vector space R3 will be a subspace. Again, that's any line specifically through the origin. Looking at R2, for example, it's pretty clear to see that any two vectors on this line will add up to another vector that is also on the line. Similarly, if we have any vector that's on the line, you could scale it by a factor of k, and it would still be on the line. So indeed, a line through the origin in R2 or R3 
is a subspace. If we were to consider a line in R2 that let's say has a slope of one and a y-intercept of one, one vector on this line would be zero, one. Another vector on this line would be one, two. And if we add these two vectors together, we get one, three which is clearly not on the line. And so this line, which isn't going through the origin, is not a subspace because it's not closed with respect to addition. We also have planes through the origin in R3. Any two vectors that are in a plane through the origin in R3 will produce, if you add them, they will produce another vector, which is also in the plane. Or if you scale one of these vectors up by some scalar k, you will also get a vector that is in this plane passing through the origin. Now, in fact, we have described all subspaces of R2 and R3. The subspaces of R2 and R3 are the zero subspace, the vector spaces themselves, lines through the origin, and in the case of R3, we also have planes through the origin. We won't prove that fact in this lesson, that these are all the subspaces of R2 and R3, but it's pretty cool that we've seen all of them. Let's look at some non-examples in R2 and R3. Here is a non-example. Consider the vector space R2 and the subset W containing only the non-negative vectors, where neither component is negative. So this would be everything in the first quadrant, or on the positive x and y axes. This is clearly not closed under scalar multiplication because the vector 1, 1 is in w, but it's negative, multiply it by negative 1, you get negative 1, negative 1, that is not in w because the components of this vector are negative, so certainly they're not in w. Similarly, we could take w to have all of the non-negative vectors and all of the negative vectors. This is like two-fourths of the entire plane, and this is not a subspace either because it is not closed under vector addition. You could take negative 10, 0, which is a negative slash non-negative vector, and you could add that to this positive sort of vector, 0, 10. Both of these vectors are in W. But if you add them together, you get negative 10, 10, which is in the second quadrant. One of these components is negative, one is positive. That is not in W by how W has been defined. So that is not a subspace either. Here are some examples of subspaces of n by n square matrices. The set of symmetric matrices forms a subspace because if you add any two symmetric matrices together or multiply a symmetric matrix by a scalar, there's nothing there that can introduce an asymmetry. So that is a subspace. Upper triangular matrices form a subspace of the square matrices. This is because there's nothing that adding upper triangular matrices can do or multiplying an upper triangular matrix by a scalar. Nothing there is going to introduce a non-zero element below the main diagonal. Similarly, for lower triangular matrices, none of our operations are going to introduce a non-zero element above the main diagonal. So both of these are subspaces, and similar logic holds for diagonal matrices. Also, all multiples of the n by n identity matrix form a subspace of the n by n square matrices. This is because if you add two multiples of the identity matrix together, or multiply a multiple of the identity matrix by a scalar, you just get another multiple of the identity matrix. If you want to see these examples gone into in a bit more detail, there's a link in the description. Let's finish by looking at a non-example of the square matrices. If we consider the set of invertible n by n matrices, this is not a subspace of all n by n matrices. We could have this matrix, A, B, C, D. This is a two by two example of an invertible matrix. And it's negative, negative A, negative B, negative C, negative D, would also have to be invertible. But if you add these two matrices together, you get the zero matrix, which is not invertible. So clearly this subset, the invertible matrices, 
is not closed under vector addition, which in this case is matrix addition. So that's what a subspace of a vector space is and how we can prove that a non-empty subset of a vector space is a subspace using the subspace test. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions and be sure to check out my linear algebra course and linear algebra exercises playlists in the description for more. Thanks for watching. Uh, uh, I'm the mathematical menace, the machinations of mankind, two calculators at the same time, hand signs and abacus, finger count and calculus, I'm the V to the T, my parameter, the rapidest, happens like this, my lectures, the most prominent, dominant, call me the Morgan, I get the compliments, the union in together like any time that we intersect. Cause my